welcome up our final speaker in this session um, or section of this session, uh, Steve, Stephen Safferman, who will talk about winter manure application. Thanks, Stephen. Okay, great. Thank you. So we're going to be a little bit more general, I think, than the last two or three presentations and specific to winter application of manure. So if you're from Texas, it might not be applicable. I do want to, rec I do want to recognize my co-authors, Jason Smith. He's an instructor at Michigan State University and um, is completing his PhD work. So a lot of this was done as part of his PhD literature review. And Rochelle Crow, who's an undergraduate research assistant who tremendously helped gathering data and organizing this data. So basically there's three different products that I want to review very, very quickly here. Uh, we, they were basically funded by North Central Regional Water Network, Manure and Soil Health Working Group, and the Soil Health Institute. The first is a comprehensive winter manure application literature review. And the last one that we had seen is from 2005, 2006. And so we thought it was well time for update, especially considering some of the, the high profile environmental issues that are going on. The second one is simply just a review of all the references that were used for the first document. So basically a very long table that includes the reference and a few important points relevant to winter manure application. And then the third is basically taking all this data that we found and making conclusions with it needs and future directions. And I'll have a link to where you can obtain these documents at the end of the presentation. So why do we care about this? Well, there's been a lot of high profile ecological issues associated with algal growth in freshwater. So um, our two of our speakers refer to, in fact, these exact pictures, Lake Erie you see on the left up there and some, some very dramatic uh, footage and something that we hadn't seen much until the last five to 10 years. Uh, so it's not just algal growth, it's not just eutrophication, it's also the blue-green algal growth or the cyanobacteria, which is toxic to wildlife, it's toxic to humans that we're finding. And um, on the, the other two pictures there are from the Grand Lake St. Mary's in Ohio. This at one time was the largest human-made lake in the country, and it has had a devastating effect on this lake. It's a shallow inland lake that's surrounded by farms, and they've lost tremendous economic a value of, of land over there and, and value from visitors. So this has been in part attributed to manure running off in winter and has caused states to start putting some bans in, or at least some considering bans, and we'll actually look at the states that I know of that have bans or considering bans or have regulations on this. And yet it's not a really well understood topic as we're going to see as we go through this. And additionally, any loss of nutrients is also a loss of a resource and that's going to cost more money for the producer and it's going to impact sustainability. So if we can keep that nutrient in the soil, obviously that's very advantageous. So let's just jump right into the, the topics and, and trying to prepare a literature review presentation was a little bit difficult. So I just chose some of the facts and figures that I thought would be of most interest and ones that showed a couple of lessons that we've learned. One is about the variability and there's the difficulty in trying to make conclusions looking at the literature, and the other about the, the different variables or the factors that uh, lead to the, the, the release of, of nutrients, especially again in winter. And so, so some of the, the nuggets, data nuggets that we, we found um, included um, in um, Wisconsin, there was one case study that found that 25% of the annual loading was due to a winter spread of waste in Vermont, a pretty staggering number of 40% of the surface water impairments were actually attributed to winter spread. And then just to show you some of the, the variety of numbers, so a plot study um, basically showed uh, variations of phosphorus, very, very large variations, um, anything from 23 to 1,086, um, I'm sorry, that was the nitrogen uh, amount and a little bit less on the phosphorus amount that ended up in the running off from that field. And so notice a couple things. First of all, most of these articles are pretty old. There's not a lot of literature on this topic. Perhaps as these new uh, edge of failed monitoring sites start to publish, there'll be some more information. But again, this is winter manure application and we definitely uh, try not to, to do that. And just um, looking at the increase in nutrient amounts due to winter applications, uh, we can see these numbers are all over the place. Again, in one study in Vermont, 
65 to 1,480 percent increase in phosphorus. Now, notice soluble phosphorus is particularly high, which is really not, uh, noteworthy because soluble phosphorus is 100 percent bioavailable. A little bit of it does a, a lot of harm. And so having very high levels of soluble phosphorus is particularly problematic, and that's what's been causing the problems with the Great Lakes and, and surface water, fresh surface waters. And notice in this study, the K, uh, TKN was, was low, it was only 14%, and ammonia was 576%. So basically from all this data, we have, we have very large ranges. The next couple studies just show a, a moderate to low level loss, 10 to 22%, and then another study, 35 to 94%. And so what's going on? Why is there so many differences? And one thing that really stands out in the literature is a lot of these articles don't have the specific characteristics of the field, the nuances that really make a, a very big difference. So just as a couple examples of articles that discuss some of these, um, in this case, a 0.8% slope, so fairly low slope, actually produced a statistically different amount of nutrient runoff, both um, phosphorus and nitrogen and also potassium um, in, in the winter than spring and fall. So obviously slope is important as the other speakers have already mentioned. Um, the flash events came up and so there's some very interesting data on flash events whereas uh, some of the flash events, in other words a very rapid melt or maybe a precipitation event on a snowpack, a, a, a rain event and warm weathers, some of these flash events could um, actually produce the whole runoff in a particular year as compared to a slow melt event. And this is, I think, particularly noteworthy in that with climate change, we are seeing a lot more intensity in terms of our storms, a lot more precipitation at any one time. So this could be very, very uh, relevant. And then obviously the timing of the application is critical as, as it has come up very clearly from the last presentations. And this is a debate that we have a lot in terms of is it better to apply uh, late fall, early winter, when we can still incorporate, and if the ground isn't frozen, compared to trying to apply in spring when we have a lot of precipitation, the manure starch structures are filled, we have to get it onto the cropland, and pretty much um, the consensus is we, we don't want to apply to saturated soil, even if the, the band is off because of temperatures, and it's most likely we'll retain those nutrients if we don't have saturated soil conditions. So. It might be preferable to, to apply in, in winter as long as we can, we can incorporate. We never want to recommend applying to frozen ground. That's going to uh, maximize potential for runoff. So on the other hand, there are some advantages applying nutrients in winter, and one that you might have heard about is ammonia retention. And sure enough, the literature bears that out in that there was a decrease in ammonia volatilization um, relative to spring application. And this is because of lower temperatures, we have less ammonia volatilization. And also there was a study on snow cover, so it does make a difference whether you apply on top of the snow or before it snows. And the snow cover also showed signs of no ammonia volatilization. However, like all of this data, there was always an exception. And so um, in, in one study, it was found that regardless, even if you saved that ammonia during the winter, as soon as the thaw occurred, you lost it anyway. So it really didn't um, help you at all. Um, in terms of other types of odor reductions and the impact in, in winter, we found no other studies for these other types of compounds like the dihydrogen sulfide compounds. Just, um, there might be something out there, but we just did not find anything. So just um, in, in summary of, of all the articles that we went through, these are all the variables. So just a very, very long list of variables from the weather conditions, to the depth of frost, the type of soil, the management practices, slope, if there's cover crops, type of tillage, and um, in particular soil moisture content is very important and macropore is very important. So all these variables uh, are very important and we typically don't see guidance in articles that have all of these covered. And so again that makes it very challenging. And so in conclusions about nutrients, um, there's lots of variability and uh, again this variability is among the, the several dependents, but also a lot of these are interdependent on each other, so it even more complicates the analysis. So it makes it difficult to come up with generalizations and making it difficult also to compare studies. So we have many studies and we have such varying results, but that's probably because some of these variables were, were quite different, but again, a lot of these articles don't get into the, the details about these variables. And obviously then it's going to be hard to find best management practices 
uh, because of all the variability. And so it demonstrates the need for detailed data presentations and good databases. Um, obviously research, a couple pictures of research that we've been doing in our lab on cover crops and the positioning of the manure in relative to the snow pack. And obviously modeling, if we can at least even model uh, qualitatively, will give us some hints on, on different conditions that are really, really difficult to work with. So moving on to the next category that we looked at, and that was pathogens. And so a long list of different pathogens that we worry about in, uh, from livestock. And so just some of the data that we found is that um, not too surprisingly, there's an increase in the risk of pathogen loss uh, when a, a thaw run a, runoff event occurs, just like any soluble fertilizer. So same type of, um, type of problem, and this has been verified in, in, in studies where they found elevated pathogen levels um, in, um, in, in drainage basins after a thaw event. Um, however, there's some contrary um, information too. Um, so first of all, cool temperatures um, can improve the survival, but freezing conditions can be <coughs> lethal to the to the bacteria. Um, so freezing might actually be beneficial according to that article. And um, absolutely a freeze thaw cycle can um, very beneficially reduce the the pathogen count by 90% as found in, in uh, one particular article. However, like all of this, there's a contradictory article that says um, after 100 days in manure frozen to minus 20 degrees C, they, um, they, they found that the E. coli survived. So conclusions, obviously conflicting results, uh, and I think we all, we all realize slight variations um, can result in substantial changes to the microbial ecology and with soil warming conditions, this is gonna change further. And then obviously using the, the coliforms as surrogates for pathogens, that can be um, maybe not as representative as using the actual pathogens we're worried about as these are typically not, um, um, not just indicator organisms, often not even pathogens. So looking at some of the new genetic techniques to measure exactly what we're worried about and how far it's migrating could be really valuable. Okay, so I want to quickly go through emerging pollutants, and um, not too surprisingly, antimicrobials are the ones that we see most about, and these are more recent articles because there's been a lot of attention and a lot of study on these, and it's interesting to note that livestock um, release 70 to 90% of the antibiotic, they excrete it unchanged, and the reason we worry about this so much is about 55% of the antimicrobial agents that are used in livestock are also used for humans. So the issue of having antibiotic resistance, which is a, a national healthcare crisis, comes up. And is this, um, are we contributing to that with these, these losses of antibiotics? So in winter, um, the antibiotics are just kind of like the, the, the nutrients in that the hydrophilic, they do move with the water. Um, the fate's not understood very well, though, especially in terms of their effectiveness with time and how far they, they, they migrate. Although it is interesting that in storage structures, especially under aerobic conditions, they have been found to disintegrate a little bit. Um, however, again, we're worried about winter manure where we don't have higher temperatures, we have the lower temperatures. So fate studies are, are crucial. And I think that one important, uh, very important note is to look at metabolites. A lot of the uh, antibiotics actually um, break down to, to starter compounds, which might be even more toxic than the parent compounds. So we need to, for complete analysis, have to look at those metabolites, which is not done very often. So real quick, again, benefits, um, going back to the benefits in general, and um, we already talked about the snow covered or cool temperatures uh, limit ammonia volatilization, and there was a study that showed that um, manure application on top of snow results in less sediment and nutrient runoff than on top of bare soils. soils. And um, there's also some practical considerations. We reduce compaction, we reduce the size and number of manure storages, and also it typically is a convenient time for farmers to spread. Although again, we, we don't at all encourage spreading on frozen ground. And so in terms of management practices, the NRCS does have a standard 590 that a lot of states use as their basis. So a pretty um, general statement about not applying to frozen ground or if the first two inches of the soil are saturated. And that's led to, um, to guidance in 
I mean, this might not be completely up to date, but states with newer application standards include Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Illinois. And there are several states that now have outright bans, all of them with different exceptions and different, different considerations. That includes Vermont, Iowa, Maryland, Indiana, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Again, I'm not sure if there's some additions to either one of those lists. I know Michigan is serious considering consideration of going to a, a ban in the future. So research needs. Um, so this is the, um, the last part of the, of the, the exercise. And um, since we have so many states now with bans or guidance, it would be interesting to review the um, incidences of emergency spreading and um, how much was the frozen ground versus incorporation in cold weather. Again, incorporation in cold weather might not be that, that much of a problem. And then in, in such locations, has there been the intended purpose? Have we reduced the input in the loading to watersheds? And when looking at it at a watershed level across state lines, just not for one drainage ditch, I think is important. And again, emphasizing that um, maybe we need to reconsider winter application as long as we can incorporate and as long as the water, uh, the soil is not saturated, and compare that to impacts when we do have saturated soil, which is or, or can be very significant. And then. Um, Obviously, the in, um, economic impact to farmers, which farms are going to be inf um, impacted, is going to be important, and that includes looking at biosecurity, where we lose the small farms. So there was a study in Michigan that was done on such issues, and um, this, in this study, in this survey, they found 27 percent of the non-CAFO farms would suspend operation if a ban were to take place. And collectively, for the non-K4 farms, there'd be a $30 million price tag to store storage for the six months. And again, even that's um, debatable whether that would, would be that effective because of applying in spring. And so a couple other ones, um, the climate change, um, that could be an important factor. Remember, slight changes do affect the, the, the potential runoff. And we think mathematical modeling, the tools that have already were discussed are going to be really valuable, are very valuable, and continue to be very valuable as, um, as people start to use them and they get refined as, as data comes in. So with that, um, I have the references, and um, this is the locations of these documents. I'd be happy to also just email you the documents um, directly. So my email is really simple, steves at msu.edu. So with that, I think we might um, have a minute for questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, I have to go through that very, very quickly. So Michigan does have um, the, the, the um, GAMPS that um, Erica talked about, which has some discussions on winter manure application. There's also some other programs, uh, the, the MEEP program, which is a voluntary program to get certified. So there are recommendations and good practices. There's nothing that I'm aware of that's regulatory at this point in Michigan. It's more uh, suggestions. Um, however, obviously, if there is a discharge um, in winter, then, um, then the, the, the subject to, to um, having regulations, having the requirements to get a discharge permit. And there were quite a few, um, quite a few discharges this last winter in Michigan that I'm aware of.